the for sure real conspiracy. So these days we just seem to be inundated with all kinds of conspiracy theories. And these really are all different kinds. They come from all different areas of life. Some of them are very plausible. Some of them we have glimpses of proof to you know, substantiate them. Some of them just border on the completely ridiculous. But it seems like with all the uncertainty in our world today that the minds of the people for the most part are very susceptible to accepting and believing these conspiracy theories. I don't know if you've noticed, but it has entered our political arenas. And what I mean by that is this. You turn on your news today and we see both sides just making up stories at random. Donald Trump called it fake news. But it's true. We're just inundated with fake news. Both sides, and I don't necessarily agree with either side, I think there's forces that are greater than both of them that are controlling them both. But folks, both sides, it seems like, you know the old thing where you take the spaghetti noodle and you throw it up against the refrigerator to see if it sticks? Remember that? It seems to me that that's what's going all day long every day in the media, the news media. They're just throwing things out there and they'll just say anything and it's up to the other side to defend themselves or prove that it's not true but it, it just has become a way of life for us these days I've said this many times I remember the days when you elected a president every four years and pretty much you had peace about politics the other three years if it wasn't an election year, you didn't hear a whole lot about it. It never stops now. 24-7, 365 days a year, you've, you've got it coming at you from both sides. But it's not just the political parties that are doing this. The major news media is just caught up in this stuff, and we have Hollywood nipping at us, everywhere you turn. We're always interviewing this one and they're always talking bad about the president. The president's people are talking bad about them. What is a conspiracy theory? Dictionary.com defines the word conspiracy is this, the act of conspiring. That goes without saying. But what are they conspiring about? This is what the dictionary says. An evil, unlawful, treacherous, or surreptitious plan formulated in secret. Secret's a big part of this word, by the way. Okay? The example that they give under number three here, it says he joined the conspiracy to overthrow the government. That would be a typical example of a conspiracy theory. And I would also bring your attention to number four, which says law, an agreement by two or more persons to commit a crime. Has something to do with breaking the law, doesn't it? So your run-of-the-mill conspiracy theory many times has something to do with overthrowing a government and or breaking laws. But there's one problem with all this. When you add the word theory, what does that do to it? By definition, what does that do to the conspiracy? Folks, we really, most of the time, we may have glimpses of evidence, but we usually don't have proof, do we? If we had proof, it wouldn't be a conspiracy theory. 
kind of like the theory of evolution. No matter what the schools are teaching your children nowadays, the theory of evolution is just that. It's a theory, right? Now, I might be one of the few preachers who will tell you this, but I believe that what we believe is the theory of creationism. Okay? It is a theory. It cannot be proven beyond any shadow of a doubt. Not one of us were there at the creation of this world. Not one of them were there at the creation of this world. And so we are dealing in theories. We can look at the evidence, we can form opinions, but we really will never be able to prove either of these theories, at least not beyond a shadow of a doubt. But then, let's approach it differently. As Bible-believing Christians, we're not about proving everything beyond a shadow of a doubt, are we? What are Christians about? To live by faith. To live by faith. That's exactly right. We are accustomed to the fact that God tells us some things that we don't understand at all. And we accept by faith what He has told us in His Word. Now, if the other side believes things that are far-fetched, they may not call it faith, but what is it? What is it that they are relying on in much of their so-called theory of evolution? And so, really what you have is two religions in the world. And I have said just a moment ago, I said I believe that the national religion is atheism. Well... The theory of evolution is a big part of that atheistic religion, whereas the theory of creationism is a very big part of the Bible religion, the true religion of the Bible. And I also want to say this. There's lots of scientific evidence to corroborate what the Bible says. It does not get equal time in the schools nor in the press, but there is lots and lots of evidence to support what the Bible teaches. But folks, the point is, for born-again, Bible-believing Christians, we accept the Word of God as the best evidence of what happened in the creation of our world. And why do we do that? Because God was there. Do they have somebody that was there when what they said happened, supposedly happened? No. But God was there. He's the one that knows for sure. Now with all this information as our foundation, I want to tell you about the real for sure conspiracy. And if you're a, if you're a Christian and believe in the Bible as being God's holy word and the truth of that Bible as it is in Jesus, then you will have to know that what I'm going to say is not a theory. If you accept the Bible as the standard of truth, it's no longer a theory. It's based on God's Word. This is the real conspiracy. And so we want to open our Bibles, and I want to make sure the Bible is the basis for what we believe and teach on any subject. Well, what does the Bible say about this real conspiracy? And I start with Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7. Because even though it's toward the end of the book, it's really toward the very beginning of the story. Right? Revelation 12, 7 says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels. Remember the example that I read for you from dictionary.com. He joined the conspiracy to overthrow the government. So here you go. The real conspiracy is all about overthrowing the government. There was a war in heaven. Michael, and I believe that is Jesus' angelic name, 
But Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels, and the reason for the war was that this dragon and his angels were trying to overthrow the government of heaven, the government of God. And who is the dragon? I often say the two easiest Bible symbols, prophetic symbols in the Bible, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, that's Jesus. And the next one is really very different but very similar. The dragon is Satan. So, really easy. But two verses later, it gets even easier. It says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So who is the great dragon? Who started the war in heaven? Satan did, that's right. Doesn't it go against everything you know and what you think about heaven? That there would be a war there? We think of heaven as this perfect place where anyone would be happy, right? What kind of being causes a war in such a beautiful place? And to me, there's a lesson in that very thing, folks. Heaven is a most wonderful place. But heaven, even heaven, is not good enough to make you love it there. Do you realize that? Heaven is not good enough to make you love to be there. Folks, if you love evil, are you going to like heaven? If you love the evil things of this world, you're not going to enjoy being in heaven. And so, therefore, you won't be there. But folks, not only is this being called a dragon, but there's a story where he's called a serpent. And there are many places where he's called the devil and Satan. But remember who it was that was fighting this war in heaven. Heaven. It was Michael the archangel, and it was the dragon, which is Satan. And they're angels, right? The Bible identifies this war causing being another way. Before he was the dragon, before he was the serpent, before he was the devil or Satan, who was this rebellious being? In Isaiah chapter 14, it tells us, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, <coughs> son of the morning? Who is this being? He's a bright and shining angel named Lucifer that was in heaven before this war but was cast out after this war. It says, How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north and verse 14 says, And I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Does this Bible verse indicate a reason for the war? Jealousy. <laughs> Jealousy, the good one. What was the reason? Folks, just like most of the wars that have ever been fought, this war in heaven was caused to try and overthrow God's government. Now, jealousy was the cause of this thing, sure enough. But it really was about overthrowing God's government. And that's just what we saw in dictionary.com about that word conspiracy. Are we dealing with a conspiracy here? Yes, I believe we are dealing with the conspiracy. So, different parties conspire to overthrow the government. Satan and his angels. According to this passage of Scripture, what was the goal of Lucifer? He wanted, to be like God. he wanted to be like God. Not just overthrow the government, but he wants to be like God. If you think of it as a kingdom, God is the king, right? 
Well, it says he wants to sit on a throne above the stars of God. And symbolically, stars, the Bible tells us, are angels. He wants to sit on a throne above the angels of God. And it says, upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, which if you read uh, all the way through the Bible, that is where the Bible says that God sits upon his throne. It's in the side of the north. And the devil also says, I will ascend upon the heights of the clouds, and that is symbolic for angels too. Remember, when Jesus comes back, there will be a cloud of angels. When he left here, there was a cloud of angels. And ultimately, I will be like the most high God. Really, what is it that Satan wants in all of this? He wants to displace God and take his throne and ultimately he wants to steal the worship. Doesn't he? Ezekiel 28 verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Verse 14 says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. So the Bible teaches us that Satan began as a beautiful angel of light in heaven. In fact, a little bit of digging in the Scriptures and we can see that this angelic being was not just an angel, but he was the highest of all the created beings. His place was on the right hand of God's throne, that covering cherub that it talks about there in verse 14. That made him not only the closest to God of all the created beings, but it made him the highest in office of them all. Right? There he was, the right hand man of God in a certain sense as that covering chair. Only God the Father and His <coughs> beloved Son were higher than the office that this bright and shining angel held. It says that He was perfect in all His ways. So did God create a devil? No. no. The trouble, the war, all of it began with the iniquity that was found deep inside of Lucifer, which is a lot like what we would call temptation. And when you have temptation inside, what are we supposed to do? Your first thing you do if you're tempted is to call upon God, right? Go to God and talk to Him about your temptation. But what did Satan do? What did Lucifer do? Just the opposite. Just the opposite. He held that, and not only did it fester inside of him, but he went behind God's back and started this rebellion in heaven. So just think about it. This is a symbolic picture here uh, that shows Jesus as the high priest in the garments of the high priest and ministering at the Ark of the Covenant. The reason I say it's a symbolic picture because <coughs> Jesus does this in the temple in heaven and that cannot be illustrated by any picture. Amen? But we look at this because it makes us think about things. So let's think about it. God sits upon His throne, the one true and living God. His Son ministers before His throne and even sits with him upon his throne at times. But it's still God's throne. And there are two covering cherubs that were appointed to serve with Jesus there. 
that are the closest to God, the closest to his seat. And if you know, the seat is symbolic of the power. It's the throne. It represents the kingdom, doesn't it? And so, Lucifer was the cherub on his right. Symbolically, number one. And everyone in heaven, yea, the whole universe, looked up to him. That's a pretty important place to be, isn't it? You've got everybody looking up to you. And that position was not good enough for him. He became jealous and he began to plan the overthrow of God's government. So think about it. The story begins with Lucifer, the bright and shining angel of God, who was the right hand covering cherub at God's very throne. But he becomes jealous of God and of Christ and so <laughs> plots the overthrow of God's government and causes this war to be made in heaven. And in that same Revelation 12, verse 4, it says, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And that tells us that those stars are angels, so a third of the angels joined in his rebellion and they were cast out of heaven down to the earth. But what was his goal in all of this? We said to overthrow the kingdom, to take God's throne, to sit above the congregation as God. But what does a congregation do? And it used that word congrega congregation, didn't it? What does a congregation do? <laughs> well, hopefully when you come together on Sabbath, the congregation worships God. So when it says to sit above the congregation, what is it actually talking about? It's talking about worshiping him. And so what do you think Satan's overall goal really is, folks? Above all the other ways we could put it, and they really all go hand in hand, but above them all we could say this, that the whole world would worship him rather than God. Now, if you know your prophecies, at the end of time in the book of Revelation, he gets pretty close to that. He gets pretty close. Again, forgive my art here. It's all I had to work with. And I told you that no computer screen can contain the glory of heaven. But I am absolutely sure that my pictures don't begin to show how wonderful Lucifer was in his original glory. There's no telling what Satan looks like now. These pictures are just for illustration. But Satan was cast out and his angels were cast out with him. And where did they go? To the earth, right? What did they do here? What is the activity of Satan and these fallen angels here on this earth? <laughs> It's exactly what they were doing when they were cast out. <laughs> and so the big question is this. The war that was started in heaven, is it over? Has it ended? Or is it still raging on just here on earth? You might say it like this. Is the devil alive and well? Let's look at some Bible verses. Ephesians 6, verses 10 and 11. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Why do you think I got this Bible verse up there at this point in our study? Is the war over? Obviously not. The followers of Christ, Christians, are told to be strong in the Lord. They're told to put on the whole armor of God. Who wears armor? It's soldiers, right? So we need to understand that the Bible says that we are all fighting in this war which was begun in heaven. And it is not as much a physical battle, if you think about it, what power could, have, could we have against supernatural beings like the devil. It's a spiritual warfare, right? 
if we will fight the good fight of faith, as it says in 1 Timothy 6, verse 12, then God will take care of the physical fighting in the battle. But we cannot escape the fact that we are engaged in a great battle right here. Ephesians 6.12 says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Not against flesh and blood, against what? Spiritual warfare. So it's a spiritual battle, and we all have a part as God's people in this battle for God's kingdom and for His throne and for His law. Amen? You might say, how can we have anything to do with the battle over God's throne? Well, what did we just read was the real goal of Satan. It's to take His throne away. It's to take the worship, to steal the worship that rightfully belongs to God. So can we have a part in that? If I give Satan my worship, have I helped his cause? So we very definitely can. And folks, it is high time to stand up for Jesus and the kingdom of God. 1 Peter 5.8 Peter says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Our adversary. What does that mean? I know it pictures him as a lion here, but our adversary is our enemy, right? It's the one that we war about. The Bible calls him the enemy of souls and tells us that he seeks to devour and destroy us. But he is the adversary and does all these things because he is fighting a war against God's kingdom. And folks, we as Christians, we are soldiers of the cross. Remember? Onward Christian (coughs) soldiers, right? (coughs) Think about this. The Apostle Paul uses the illustration of the armor of a soldier here, which was probably, you know, I'm saying this picture was probably the way that Paul would see things because that's what a soldier looked like in his day and in the kingdom in which he lived there. And he used all the pieces of this armor and made spiritual applications to them for every piece of the armor. And it's a great illustration because we really are soldiers in the Lord's army. And why? Because there's a war. When do you put your soldiers in uniform and and put them in their armor? when there's a war, right? So think about things in just these terms. But folks, there is nothing new about this mentality. Think about how many songs we have in our songbook. You know, on page 606 in the Seventh-day Adventist hymnal, it says down at the bottom of the page, Christian Warfare. And that very first song, once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side. The next one is God of grace and God of glory. Faith is the victory. Am I a soldier of the cross? Stand like the brave. Onward Christian soldiers. Fight the good fight. Sound the battle cry. Rise up. O church of of God, soldiers of Christ, arise. And there's lots more that aren't in our book. Now, if there really is a war going on, what would be the worst thing that a person could do during wartime? Treason. Treason. That would be like working for the other side, helping the other side, wouldn't it? You know... We have some of that going on in our world, don't we? But another another really bad thing that people would do is if you're a soldier and you run and hide from the battle, what do we call that? That's cowardice, isn't it? It absolutely is. 
And folks, an awful lot of Christians, that's going to be what's going to happen with them. They're going to back down from the fight. Have we established a conspiracy here? You know, we've even shown what the conspiracy really is. The attempt to overthrow the kingdom or government of God, to take His throne, to steal the worship that is rightfully His. That is what Satan and his followers are really up to. But generally, people think that this is just the fight of good over evil. But I want you to see that the war is a religious war. It's a war between two religions. According to the Bible, Revelation 19 and verse 10, and I know that probably most of you know that whole Bible verse by heart, but I've just selected a couple of words. What does it say in Revelation 19.10? It says, worship God. There's other things being said here, but I single out these words because this is the message of the Holy Bible. Who are we to worship? God. The very first words of the Bible. In the beginning, God. And all throughout it, right up to the very end of the prophecies of the book of Revelation, we are being told to worship God. Now, I submit to you that there had to be a reason for the Bible to say something that is so matter of fact. Why would it tell us? You know, the, the car manual doesn't say drive car. Right? It assumes that. Why does our manual, why does the Christian's manual say worship God? As simple of a concept as that is. And by the way, the same words are found in Revelation 22.9. That's the very last page of the book, right? Worship God. There are so many times that the Bible tells us to worship God, folks, that we, there's no way we could read them all here. But there's something very important being said when it tells you something so matter-of-fact <coughs> It tells us that in the last days, the majority of the people, even the ones who call themselves Christians, are not worshiping God. That sounds really stern. But if you read your Bibles, it is the truth. We are to worship God. And who else do we worship? We do worship the Son of God. Um, but I do think it's important that we understand in worshiping the Son of God what's really the object of worshiping Jesus. It, it really is the Father. Okay. Now, I'm not trying to belittle or take anything away from Jesus, but He was given so that the world might be saved and be reconciled to the Father. Right? Amen. Amen to that, brother. So, when we, we, we actually worship Jesus, that's, that's the act of worshiping the Father in and of itself when we do worship Jesus. He is the way to the Father, isn't He? And He tells us that over and over. Well, anyway, the reason I say that Who is the world? The majority of the people in the world worshiping when they go to church. I mean, it's a real question and it makes you think, but there's been a lot of trickery. If Satan steals the throne, if Satan sits on the throne and the whole world wanders after the beast like it says in, in Revelation... Who's the whole world worshiping? They're really, they may think they're worshiping God. Yeah. But they're worshiping Him. 
That's something that's really amazing to think about. Let's go back to the beginning of the story. Exodus 34, verse 14 is closer to that end of the book. For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. God has many, many names and titles, but make no mistake about it, folks. Jealous is one of them. And what is God jealous about? According to this Bible verse, it's worship, isn't it? He is jealous when it comes to our worship. We are to worship no other God but the true and living God of heaven. Deuteronomy 11, verse 16. Take heed to yourself that your heart be not deceived and ye turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Folks, as you go through the Bible record, you will find that this is the great problem that the church and the world have been facing all along. They have turned themselves unto other gods. And notice that this particular Bible verse is dealing with the Old Testament Jews who were referred to back then as God's chosen people. What did they do? Yeah, they not only back then turned to the idols, but when Jesus finally came in New Testament times, they rejected Him, didn't they? They turned aside and they worshipped other gods. Jesus said in Matthew 4.10, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. This great Bible verse is telling about the temptation of Jesus himself when he was met by the devil out in the wilderness. And what did Jesus say to him? He says, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And so Jesus refuses to worship the devil, which is what he was actually asking, but Jesus says it so very plainly. Who only do we worship? God, His heavenly Father. That's right. So, this is the ongoing problem with God's chosen people, His church. And again, I want to kind of blend these two themes that we're looking at here because as soldiers in an active war, can we be neutral? That's very important. It's all or nothing. Amen, brother. Is there a reason for this continual problem among God's people? And I would say definitely yes, because this is just what Satan has been deceiving and tempting God's people about from the very beginning. This is what the conspiracy is all about. Luke chapter 4 and verse 8, Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Again, this is a parallel gospel verse in the book of Luke, but it says it so succinctly, Thou shalt worship the Lord God, and him only shalt thou serve one of the most important messages ever delivered to mankind. Now I want to consider just one more line of scriptural reasoning before we get into some very detailed information together. As Christians, we recognize something very important. We call it the Great Gospel Commission. And it's found in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. It says, Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is our marching orders directly from the captain himself. Amen? From Jesus himself. And what are we supposed to be doing? Preaching the gospel. And to whom are we supposed to preach this gospel message? To everyone, right? To the whole world. It says in all the world. Now, if you think about it, we've just realized a formula from Jesus himself. And the formula is this. You preach the gospel, 
You preach it to the whole world. And then, look at Matthew 24, verse 14. Jesus again talking. It says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. This is Jesus himself. What does he tell us? Preach the gospel. Preach it to the whole world. And what happens? The end comes. The end of this world is what he's talking about. His second coming that finishes off the history of this sin-riddled world. The end of what? The end of the world as we know it. It's not the end altogether, but he'll make a new heaven and a new earth. But the second coming, the end of the world, is just what Jesus is prophesying about in this great chapter, Matthew 24. So our formula that we are seeing is this. You preach the gospel in all the world, and the end of the world comes. So it places this gospel in all the world at the very end of the world, doesn't it? That's important because God has given us some end time prophecies that specifically tell us about this end of the world gospel that has to be preached. And it's Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6 says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So I know this is a prophecy, and so there are symbols that are being used, but even without going into a whole study on the subject, we can see something very important here. What does this prophecy concern? What's it about? It says the everlasting gospel. What did Jesus say? You preach the gospel in all the world and the end comes. We're dealing with future prophecy toward the end of the book of Revelation. Do you think this could be the, the gospel that Jesus was talking about that had to go to the whole world? To every nation and kindred and tongue and people? Look at what it says next saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Notice what it says. Worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Why would the Bible feel the need to tell us to worship God? There has to be a problem in this regard, wouldn't you say? I know that I'm barely giving you anything about this right now, but for the sake of time in this presentation, I just need for you to see that there is a final gospel message that is to go to all the earth just before the end of time. And that gospel is called the everlasting gospel message and it has to do in a very big way with who and how we are worshiping God. Who we are worshiping. The gospel com commands us to worship the true God that created the heavens and the earth and everything in it. So this too fits into the conspiracy, I think about an overthrow of the government of God and the stealing away of the worship that should be His and His alone. If you look at the very next verse, it says, There followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. <clears throat> So there is a conspiracy to overthrow the kingdom of God. And as such, this being the last days, we are given a very special gospel message that is to be preached in all the world. And it only makes sense that this message would be seeking to deal with the subject of this rebellion that has taken place in heaven and is now 
the wars on this earth. This overthrow of the government of God. So let's look really close at what's being said here. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. <coughs> A very important part of this everlasting gospel message for the last days, just before Jesus comes, is the message that this great city called Babylon is fallen. And of course, we understand this is symbolic prophecy that's being dealt with here. There's more to the message of these prophecies, but a very big part of this everlasting gospel message is about Babylon. This other city is fallen. So I just want to take this bite and chew on it for just a bit and see what we can find about this right here. Right here near the end of our Bibles is the message about Babylon. And to learn about this great subject, we would do well to search the whole Bible about what it is saying concerning Babylon. How do you know what a prophetic symbol really means? I mean, one preacher will say this that he gets from a book and another preacher will say this that he hears on the news. How can you depend on things like that? They're so random. But if the Bible tells us what it's talking about, then we'll know for sure. So where do we look? We look to God's holy book. And I'm going to stop right there. And next week we're going to pick this up and we're going we're gonna to continue talking about this conspiracy in these last days.